They were smart back in the 1970s also. They said, well, computers are coming. We better be able to classify everything nurses do in order to get our data to prove that we're worth something so that we don't disappear. And so we have all of these ways of describing what nurses do now. Uh, some people were saying, were really like saying nurses don't do really that much different from other people in healthcare, so we should make it for everybody to use. So there are multidisciplinary terminologies as well. How many of you have heard of SNOMED CT? LOINC? Like these are the clinical terminologies that are required by our government um, for, for a certification of electronic health records. But we also have all these other NANDONIC, NOC, CCC, PNDS, ICAP. These are all languages nurses made up. But there's another one that was in a software system that I bought. And this happened when I was a, a nurse manager in a public health department. So what in Minnesota. My director called me into her office and she said, Karen, you will computerize your nursing documentation and give me outcomes, 1997. I said, okay. I went shopping, found two softwares, one that said they could give me outcomes, one that said we're not there yet. So I bought the one that said that they would give me outcomes. And in that software was this Omaha system. So this is the concept map of the Omaha system. And it just is a beautiful way of interrelating problems, interventions, and outcomes. I won't go into it, but all the pictures you're going to see look, are, are from data that come from this really um, elegant and rigorous classification system. It also includes a measure, so you get your continuous data with it. It's, uh, so public health nurses back in the 1990s were pretty smart. They figured out how to use this in electronic health records and uh, proved it could be done. And I'm the kind of one of the spokespersons that shows how the, that nursing data uh, is really transformative. So here you go. Um, you'll be glad to see this, Reese. Uh, any statistical package will give you visualizations. So you use them, but you need to know why you're using them and what, um, you know, for which variables. And so we wrote an article, this is a 2015 paper about if you have different kinds of, of data, categorical and, con and continuous data, what could you do with that and all the different kinds of visualizations you can make. This is, there's similar pictures by other authors. This is in uh, uh, Computers Informatics Nursing. And so this I just sort of organized this according to that diagram. But what we're seeing here is how do um, interventions from a particular data set, and this is for frequent flyers in an emergency room in Hennepin County, um, which is a large county in Minneapolis area, how do interventions compare over the lifetime with signs and symptoms? And we see that for the most part, these folks and their health records, <coughs> we were able to extract mainly if you have a sign of symptom, you're going to get an intervention. It looks pretty much the same, right? Except for which problems. Well, boy, doesn't this stick out here, mental health. Doing a lot more interventions for mental health. Income here, pain here. So it doesn't always match one intervention for one problem. No, we have to be aware that we are seeing other kinds of patterns in the data, and then we need to respond to that. Now, uh, as if it, that was in Excel, and you'll note that in all of my slides I say how we <coughs> created these pictures and who created them, because a lot of times, this is like people need to get credit for their science. And if we're doing pattern detection, and, and you're putting a, an image in something, say who made it and, and what they used. Um, two ways of depicting the same data. I don't know about you, but I can see pattern a lot easier in this dot plot than I can in this double um, stack or yeah bar chart thing. So my message here is, and this is a this is a kind of chart that you're going to use for your comparing two variables. What do you use for comparing one variable to itself? A pie chart. Should you ever make a pie chart? Probably not. Not interesting. Not. Not valuable in it. In most situations, I'll show you some fancy pie charts later, though. But um, the idea being, one variable pie chart, two variables bar charts. And this is another example of a dot plot. Now, if we're talking to people in the community about their health and the social determinants of health, they're strongly represented here. We have things like 
uh, income, we have residence, we have sanitation, we have neighborhood workplace safety, we have mental health, spirituality, grief, social contact, we have personal care, medication regimen, going to the doctor, healthcare supervision, sleep is huge. Okay, most people have a lot more strengths, which are the blue dots, than challenges, which are the red dots, than needs, which are the green dots. So you start to get a picture of a population that really has a lot going for it. This is resilience, this is strength, this is cutting edge, this is consumer driven, healthcare data, analytics. Wow, yay! I got an app for this. Yes. All right, bubble charts. Okay, we did um, one variable pie chart, and I'm going to make those two variables bar graphs, three variables bubble charts. Yay! Look at the size of these. They tell you something. How many people are in this population? You also know how much they changed and they improved after their healthcare interventions by looking on this axis, and you also know their age by looking on this axis. So three variables. If you are comparing three variables, you need a bubble chart. And with, this is a latent class analysis we did to look at health literacy for mothers and children in the community. And we just took the entire huge sample. Actually, this is half of the study. Here's the other half. Um, noticing in the age continuum here, whoops. Um, these are young folks, right? We got three different groups in this uh, latent class analysis that turned out to be pretty young. And then we got two different groups here that turned out to be older. And what do you notice between th these two pictures? Well, people got a lot more improvement after intervention when they were young than they did when they were old. Isn't that fascinating? So this is like, this is a 2018 paper, and of course, tons and tons more research can be done once you identify these interesting groups. Um, so this is a whole social determinants of health study, looking at people by the number of social determinants, adding it up into a metric, and then here's a histogram showing you what that metric is. So histograms, this is continuous data now, right? So we've just finished looking at a bunch of categorical data, now we're looking at continuous data. Here's some pie charts! Yay! So these are not pie charts alone. These are just these are special pie charts because they show a lot of data in a single image. Each of these images probably has four um, hundred data points in it. So we tell around the edge there's all these different signs and symptoms that they could be. Each of these colored segments is a different problem. Each of these rings tells us the severity of the knowledge, behavior, and status related to that problem. So you can compare individuals, group them. So this is, a, once again, what we said, we have machines to do stuff, but people are needed. People picked out the patterns in the images that were created by the machines. And people put them together. This was created by Eric Kim, one of our master students that's now finished her PhD. She said, oh my gosh, look at these shiny ones. And they have all these signs and symptoms. I wonder what's different about them. She saw them in the sample. And so we matched them over here to these folks, and they had no signs and symptoms in that mental health problem. And it turned out, these folks, we found out because of this image and how they grouped together, this is a special population. These are mothers with mental health problems. And, and they had more problems and worse outcomes than a matched cohort that didn't have those mental health signs and symptoms. So that's what the data exploration does. It gives you the chance to look for patterns, and then when you find the patterns, then you can test them with the data. And you can test them with other data sets. And if you test them with other data sets and that problem or that pattern persists over and over, then you've got something to talk about, right? Questions? Going too fast? Okay. Uh, stacked bar charts, which one do you like better? Well, it depends. It depends on if you want to see, like for here, mental health. It says here that people who deal with mental health are primary care providers, nurses, and social workers only. Now, if I look over here at mental health, it says the same thing, and it also says that you only get to do that with two different interventions. So we're looking here at scope of practice from a clinical guideline and how it's mapped. And 
even you can even do analysis of clinical guidelines and rules and responsibilities once you've applied standardization to anything. Just keep standardizing it the same way that you could do your comparisons across. I don't remember who it said, don't we need to standardize first? The answer is yes. This is also a, an example of a very rigorous and robust healthcare ontology. I've been trying to break it since 2000, approximately 2000 when I went back to school to get my master's degree, and um, I haven't been able to. Here's another example of how we can look at scope of practice using these stacked ch bar charts. Here is this stupid pie chart. I just put it up there because uh, people like to make them, but really, so much better to see the histogram, right? You really understand the distribution of the data so much better. Okay, what's this? Venn diagram. If you have more than three variables, you need a Venn diagram. These are hard to make. This took me eight hours with Word. You can go online. There are online Venn diagram generators, but you have to know how many things are at the intersection of each of the intersecting circles in the Venn diagram. So prepare to do manual labor, but Venn diagrams are very useful. This one shows uh, we did some clustering with 621,000 home care interventions, did a couple different clustering techniques and several iter iterations, and came up with this amazing discovery that there's two basic kinds of home care. One is basic care here, and the other is comprehensive care. And what you get in your basic care is something like that our health care insurers would really like to know, right? Our insurers would like us to walk in, do the basic care, and walk out. Well, basic care consists of some surveillance, some treatment, and some case management, in and out. Here's comprehensive care. It includes a lot more checking in, probably on things that you wouldn't think, like social determinants of health, and here's your teaching guidance and counseling. Is there any of that in the basic care? No, there is not. And we found this, this is for wound care, but over and over and over for different health care complaints. Now there's Florence again. Bless her heart, she did good. Um, just an a example of a multi-series line graph, looking, the survival analysis, typically that's for how many people die uh, for various reasons, but in this case, we are looking at when did a problem stabilize. And we found differential problem stabilization by problem. So these ones never did stabilize up here. Uh, those are parenting and pregnancy because something's always changing. When you're a parent, you're always giving anticipatory guidance. There's always something new happening. This one, when you're pregnant, there's always something new to talk about every month. So these, these lines never change, but uh, here are problems like mental health, um, family planning, substance use. These kinds of problems improved quickly with the public health nurse visit, and um, the nurse just went back to check, to check, to check. That's what that shows. Uh, their multi-series line graph, this is change over time and outcome after several home visits to people, these are elderly or um, just community dwelling folks who live in a depressed area in Mexico, and it was related to the diabetes. So uh, these are also multi-series lines graphs, but with a no base line. So it spreads out, the baseline spreads out, they're called stream graphs. These were made in D3, also by Anna Kim. Um, so this, when you look at these, you can say, hey, the nurse, didn't do the same thing every time she walked into a person's home. Because every person's different, and every nurse is different, and every person's problems are different. So we use this data to discover that really it, it's uh, amazing how it's the nurse herself who contributes to the final outcome. We, had, we were able to identify specific nurses who had outcomes that were far better than other nurses, and try writing about that with um, a correct, um, politically correct way. But it's also really cool to see that this is quality of care, and I would uh, just challenge all of you because we are walking down a street in healthcare that says healthcare must be systematized. And we do not recognize that healthcare must be also individualized. And if we do not have 
patient-centered individualized care, which is what's going on in these pictures. No two patients care are alike here. If we do not do this, we lose because we don't get the benefit of the smart clinician who knows what's right for the patient. So a lot of fun, a lot of color, a lot of these pictures, string graphs, D3. Come on, oh, this one, okay. So this is messy, multi-series line graphs, counting, signs and symptoms interventions. Um, these are the knowledge and behavior status scores. I put it on there because this is research. We're looking for patterns. It doesn't have to be pretty. In fact, it should not be. And you should play with your data over and over and over. Make lots of pictures. Do different things, even things that are not recommended. You know, your, your software program will offer you five examples of what you might do with this data. Look at all five. Even if it's not specifically for categorical data or continuous data or you, or you think it might work in a new way, try that because what you're looking for is pattern. And you, in your head, should kind of be attuned to what patterns might be coming and be looking for that. And that's a skill that a data analytics, a visualization analytics person needs to have. And what we found, of course, is this really fun pattern that you would never see if you only looked at the jagged lines. And we put these trend lines in, and we saw as the outcome scores increased, uh, the interventions increase. So people get better more if they have more help. And this happens over and over again in our studies. Uh, it's not exactly what our insurance companies want to hear. Um, maps are awesome, GIS is awesome, you'll be able to use those in, in your work, um, and you should. So here's a great map of, of your neighboring state. We did manage to get some of your neighboring state. See this point here somewhere? Which one do you like better? The chloropleth up there with with the uh, shaded counties, or do you like the measles version? I personally do not like the measles version myself. Too, it's too close to home in public health. Um, pad parallel coordinates. This is really, really fun. <laughs> so, axis, 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 axis. If you want to compare lots and lots of different things, you can put them all, normalize them, on the Y and, and line them up on the X. And brilliant people use these to compare lots of things. And this is really how we discovered the nurse effect. And we testified uh, at the Institute of Medicine on that one. Um, here's a, just a, a, one of my favorite slides of my life. Here's public health nurses' assessments of mothers who are struggling in the community. And this is before they get a visit by the public health nurse. And this is all the interventions. And I've shown you lots and lots of pictures of interventions. In this picture, we don't see any of them. We just see this line between the two before and after. And here's the after. Well, what do you notice? Oh my gosh, after is higher than before. People got better. So hey, that's great. And something else happened. What's the pattern on this side? <coughs> Stratification. Stratification by race and ethnicity. Oh, terrible. What's happened over here? Pattern by problem instead. Public health nurses take away health disparities by race and ethnicity. Whoa. So you, you find this pattern and you test it. And it turns out to be a really good thing for people, for policy, for the world. Okay, here's a... Um, Here's social and behavioral determinants of health. What happens to people with those, remember the histogram? Well, these are the people divided up. These are 4,000 mothers divided into groups by whether they had no social determinants or five or more on a continuum. Just We just added them up so there's no like weighting or anything fancy. And what do we find? Everybody gets better. This is the amount of improvement across groups. Straight line, straight line, straight line. Everybody gets better after public health nurse. Good news. What's the bad news? Oh my gosh. People 
As social and behavioral determinants of health increase, outcome scores decrease. These are final outcomes. And, and what's this dotted line? Well, that is the number of interventions it takes to get to this final score. It takes a lot more work to get to a lower outcome when we are experiencing five or more social determinants of health. So everything we said about that, we take to heart. And what we know is, plan ahead so that you have the policy in place so that you can serve the people who need it. Here's the heat map. Love heat maps. Everybody know how to make one? Conditional formatting. Do it. Every table you make, every data set, every sheet you have, highlight it. Look at it. Look for pattern. Here's your uh, five groups. If the distribution by sign or symptom was the same across the sample, across all these, then this pattern would repeat over and over and over, would it not? But it does not repeat. No, it does not. We have different patterns depending. Here's, here's whether you're married or not. And here's minority. And here's income. And these are uh, depression, stress. Here's, and these are, these are decided by the uh, Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academies of Medicine. Uh, they pick these items. We have them in our data set before they ever picked them. Uh, this is abuse. Look at that. Substance use. This is abuse is alcohol. So we tested these patterns. This is visualization science. All it is is results in a, in a table, and I put conditional formatting on it, and I found patterns, and we tested them. This will take you less than one minute to create once you have your, once you have your distribution of your sample. And the, this is a 2017 paper, Social Behavior Determinants, um, Women of Childbearing Age Receiving Public Health or Some Visiting Services. And, uh, so again, this heat map. This is a different sample, but we're looking at the same process. This is every single person in a wound care study done in South Carolina. And what we found is, oh my gosh, there's a big green spot here. And the same proportionally, we do not see that green spot over here. Same with this and this. Well, this is about whether or not people adhered to their wound care treatment and whether they um, had a repeat wound. And guess what? Guess what we found? This is so fascinating. It's the mental health problem that shows up. If you have positive mental health attributes, you were less likely to have a repeat wound. And you were more likely to stick to your wound routine. How did we find it? Well, we had this beautiful green spot that we looked at. This is what visual analytics does. Another heat map, this just shows you end of life care, looking at mental health across the continuum of care, and that the nurse is doing a lot of the work. I just put that into so many buttons. And, and Reese, you can ignore this because it's Excel, but it just shows you, this is your little bonus how you do conditional formatting in Excel. Uh, and this, remember Anscombe? Remember Anscombe? So he made four. Well, this is the data source dozen. So every single one of these 12 data sets has the same statistical properties as the data store. So if you want to be famous, you can make your uh, 100 data sets. So visualization play, it works for nursing data, and I would argue all of healthcare data. And try it, your brain will like it. I had to bring Goldie, sorry. <laughs> I don't think we have any minutes. Uh, we have about two minutes for questions. <laughs> yes? Uh, any cautions, like when we're visualizing data, to make sure we don't like, accidentally mislead with our visualization to make sure it's accurate to the data? Or how, I guess, how would we make sure we don't do that? How to make sure not to mislead? Yeah. Um, so one thing is replicate, replicate, replicate. So you know, we discovered the green spot. You know, that should be tested in 100 more data sets like that. Um, so that's number one, because other, you, you can be accused of, with large data sets, patterns abound, right? So you want to make sure that the patterns that you find 
you can publish about them and say, we found this pattern, everybody should try to find it, because it's important. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I think, I, uh, I, I think people selectively visualize all the time. And I didn't talk about so much the, the expl explanatory kind of data visualization, but I think um, maybe that misleading thing happens more in that space where we, we show you what we want you to see. Like, there was a big dip in the stock market, and then it came back, and what we're going to show you is the climb after that, right? So it's distorting axes. I mean, in visualization work, you will distort your axes. You'll do everything to try to figure out what is the pattern I'm seeing. Just make sure that when you publish or write about it or share it or disseminate, you've confirmed it, you've studied it, um, you've tested it in at least one other, or if you know, split your sample, if you have a lot of data, split your sample, look at it one, and then test it in the other, those kinds of things. Thank you for asking. I think we take one more question. I'm happy to work with people. I'll just put that out there. Well, thank you for coming. My great pleasure.